think that's the last one. It's a lovely prelude. Welcome to the 11th annual um, Poetry on the Patio. I'm Dan Jelton, director of the libraries. I'm very happy to have you here uh, today. I love, uh, we love, I love it when there's at least a section of the audience wishing they had slathered on some sunscreen before they came over. That's really good. Doesn't always happen. Um, Julie Kimlinger, I just want to thank Julie again right away for uh, once again arranging uh, today's um, program. She works all year long uh, to get uh, readers together um, to uh, stand up and read their favorite poems today. And I also want to introduce and thank Kirsten Durking, uh, who will be reading. She'll be our last poet today. Kirsten was an employee of the libraries back in 1999 when I think it was sort of your idea, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and it's a good one. It has become, uh, as I was saying uh, to somebody, it was a, uh, it's a now a highlight of my uh, year. So for 11 years, I, uh, let me explain a little bit about what we do here. For 11 years, uh, uh, Julie has organized readers from all walks of life at St. Thomas. We've had students, we've had faculty, we've had staff uh, who do all kinds of things for the University of St. Thomas to come and read um, not their own poetry, but the poems that have meant something to them, their favorite poems. Um, it happens during April, which is National Poetry Month, and it always happens at the very, very end of April here in Minnesota because we want to be outside. Um, and, um, uh, you know, there have been a lot of days this month that, that it wouldn't have been very nice to be out here. Um, I think we've only been inside about once, maybe, well, in 11 years, so we've been very lucky. Um, the, the poetry uh, favorite poem project was uh, started by Robert Pinsky, who was a uh, poet laureate back in 1997. Um, and it has, really, uh, it has really blossomed into something neat. It's yielded two, at least two really fine uh, poetry anthologies that he's put together um, based on people's um, uh, uh, identification of the poems that have meant the most to them. And I want to just say a couple things about what he was thinking when he uh, started this. I mean, the idea was uh, f uh, essentially that Americans do read poems, um, which is a con maybe contrary to conventionalism, and that they have favorite poems. Um, and, and, and furthermore, uh, Pinsky uh, believes that poems should be uh, said aloud rather than read silently. Poems are a kind of song, and it's like having an instrument sitting there that you're not playing if you just read it to yourself. So I wanted to... Um, uh, read a couple of things that he said uh, back when, when this project was, um, was initiated. He writes, There is a special comfort and excitement people get from saying aloud words with a certain sound in a certain order. By reading poems we love aloud, we can learn how much pleasure there can be in the sounds of words. It's as though saying the words of a poem aloud make one feel more able, more capable than in ordinary life. You can concentrate on the physical sounds of the words to a point where they give you an emotional or an intellectual relief. You enter a different state. Uh, and then he goes on, one of the beautiful things about poetry is that the medium is the human body and its voice, not necessarily the artist's body. When you say a poem aloud by William Shakespeare, Emily Dickinson, or Langston Hughes, your voice is the artist's medium. So that's what we're gonna do today. Uh, and the way this works, I um, while we um, try not to repeat readers from year to year because we want to get as many people from St. Thomas involved in this as possible, Julie has let me read every single time. Um, and I appreciate that, Julie. Thank you very much. Um, the everyone else, um, so wh when, I, when I'm done, please uh, uh, just step up. You have uh, the order in your hand. Uh, tell us who you are and what your connection to St. Thomas is. And you might say a, w a word or two about the poem, too, if it's uh, especially um, uh, meaningful to you. I'm actually going to uh, start with two short poems today uh, by W.S. Merwin, who was recently uh, uh, given the Pulitzer Prize for the second time for his book, The Shadow of Sirius. Uh, that's uh, Sirius, S-I-R-I-U-S, as in the star. And uh, the first poem that I'd like to read is from that book. It's called Youth. 
through all of youth I was looking for you without knowing what I was looking for or what to call you. I think I did not even know I was looking. How would I have known? How would I have known you when I saw you as I did time after time when you appeared to me, as you did naked, offering yourself entirely at that moment, and you let me breathe you, touch you, taste you, knowing no more than I did, and only when I began to think of losing you did I recognize you, when you were already part memory, part distance, remaining mine in the ways that I learned to miss you. From what we cannot hold, the stars are made. And secondly, from his book, uh, Present Company, published in 2007, uh, this is To This May. They know so much more now about the heart, we are told, but the world still seems to come one at a time, one day, one year, one season, and here it is spring once more, with its birds nesting in the holes in the walls, its morning finding the first time, its light pretending not to move, always beginning as it goes. I already decided I have to move out of the sunshine like a vampire. Okay, I'm going to read um, Two Tramps in Mud Time by Robert Frost. Out of the mud two strangers came and caught me splitting wood in the yard, and one of them put me off my aim by hailing cheerily, Hit them hard! I knew pretty well why he had dropped behind and let the other go on away. He wanted... I knew pretty well what he had in mind. He wanted to take my job for pay. Good blocks of oak it was I split, as large around as the chopping block, and every piece I squarely hit fell splinterless as a cloven rock. The blows that a life of self-control spares to strike for the common good, that day giving a loose my soul I spent on the unimportant wood. The sun was warm, but the wind was chill. You know how it is with an April day, when the sun is out and the wind is still, you're one month on in the middle of May. But if you so much as dare to speak, a cloud comes over the sunlit arch, a wind comes off a frozen peak and you're two months back in the middle of March. A bluebird comes tenderly up to a light and turns to the wind to unruffle a plume, his song so pitched as not to excite a single flower as yet to bloom. It is snowing a flake, and he half knew winter was only playing possum, except in color he isn't blue, but he wouldn't advise a thing to blossom. The water for which we may have to look in summertime with a witching wand, in every wheel ruts now a brook, in every print of a hoof a pond, be glad of water, but don't forget the lurking frost in the earth beneath that will steal forth after the sun is set and show on the water its crystal teeth. The time when most I loved my task, the two must make me love it more. By coming with what they came to ask, you'd think I had never felt before the weight of an axe head poised aloft, the grip of earth on outspread feet, the life of muscles rocking soft and smooth and moist in vernal heat. Out of the wood, two hulking tramps from sleeping God knows where last night, but not long since in the lumber camps. They thought all chopping was theirs of right. Men of the woods and lumberjacks, they judged me by their appropriate tool. Except as a fellow handled an ax, they had no way of knowing a fool. Nothing on either side was said. They knew they had but to stay their stay, and all their logic would fill my head, as that I had no right to play with what was another man's work for gain. My right might be love, but theirs was need. And where those two exist in twain, theirs was the better right. Agreed. But yield who will to their separation. My object in living is to unite my avocation and my vocation, as my two eyes make one in sight. For only where love and need are one, and the work is play for mortal stakes, is the deed ever really done for heaven and the future sakes. The second poem I'm going to read is um, a poem by Richard Wilbur called Love Calls Us to the Things of This World. And the title is actually uh, um, taken from St. Augustine. And this is, a, this is what Wilbur said about it. He said, Plato, St. Teresa, and the rest of us in our degree have known that it is painful to return to the cave, to the earth, to the quotidian. Augustine says that it is love that brings us back. And then he also said, um, 
kind of setting up the poem one time for a reader. He said, you must imagine the poem as occurring at perhaps 7.30 in the morning. The scene is a bedroom high up in a city apartment building. Outside the bedroom window, the first laundry of the day is being yanked across the sky, and one has been awakened by the squeaking pulleys of the laundry line. So this is probably my all-time favorite poem, and it's about laundry. Love calls us to the things of this world. The eyes open to a cry of pulleys, and spirited from sleep, the astounded soul hangs for a moment, bodiless and simple as false dawn. Outside the open window, the morning air is all awash with angels. Some are in bedsheets, some are in blouses, some are in smocks, but truly they are there. Now they are rising together in calm swells of halcyon feeling, filling whatever they wear with the deep joy of their impersonal breathing. Now they are flying in place, conveying the terrible speed of their omnipresence, moving and staying like white water. And now, of a sudden, they swoon down into so rapt a quiet that nobody seems to be there. The soul shrinks from all that it is about to remember, from the punctual rape of every blessed day, and cries, oh, let there be nothing on earth but laundry, nothing but rosy hands in the rising steam and clear dances done in the sight of heaven. Yet, as the sun acknowledges with a warm look the world's hunks and colors, the soul descends once more in bitter love to accept the waking body, saying now in a changed voice as the man yawns and rises, bring them down from their ruddy gallows. Let there be clean linen for the backs of thieves. Let lovers go fresh and young to be undone, and the heaviest nuns walk in a pure floating of dark habits keeping their difficult balance. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Banigan, and I uh, work in the development office here. Um, I chose a poem by the name of Baseball in Heaven by RSS Anderson. Um, April is my favorite month because it's the start of a seven-month courtship I get to have with my favorite pastime, which is baseball, all things baseball. Uh, I'm well past my prime of playing, if I ever had one, but uh, I'm still playing today. Uh, and, and so I got this actually from a teammate of mine on my 35 and over baseball team who shares his passion with baseball. Uh, and again, it's called Baseball in Heaven. Hey, Mom, do you know they have baseball in heaven? I pitched for the angels on my first day. Moses was a, a bit annoyed. I got caught stealing. He said, they don't do that here. Hey, Mom, do you know they have dogs in heaven? I got one today. His name is Jake. He follows me everywhere I go and likes to lick my face. So, Mom, I guess what I'm trying to say is that things really aren't so bad. I miss you and the family a lot at times. I miss the, I miss the guy stuff I did with Dad. I do have some good news, though. At night, when you fall asleep, God said, I can talk to you in your dreams. So those times I show up and we laugh and play, they are as real as they seem. Promise you'll talk to me, okay? I can hear you when you pray. Hey, Mom, do you know they have baseball in heaven? Oh, that's right. I said that before. I hit a homer just a while ago. Abraham and Gabriel came in for a score. A cameraman came close to get my picture just like they do for the pros on TV. I had the biggest smile you've ever seen. I put my face close to the lens. It was huge and filled the screen. Do you know what I said? Of course you do. I looked in it and said, hi, Mom. Hi, I'm Julie Kimlinger, and I work in the library office. And I got a message from Bernie Brady, and I thought that after reading his message, I wanted to stand in for him, and, uh, but I don't want to rule him out from coming next year. Here is his message. Julie, last year I said I would read a poem. I picked a poem, practiced reading the poem, and forgot to go. This year I spent time on the internet and communicating with people in the know and found four poems that I liked. I just went to check my calendar and I have a faculty senate meeting at noon on April 28th, ugh. So here is one, the shortest, of my final four favorites, none of which I will be able to read on the patio. Thanks for the invitation, and please keep me on the list for next year. 
Well, after reading his choice, I just felt this is such a dear and sad poem. I did want to share it with you. It's called Sweet Jam, Seamus O'Neill. There was jam on the door handle, but I suppressed the vexation that rose up in me because I thought of the day that the door handle would be clean and the little hand sought for. Thank you. Hi, I'm Carrie Anthony. I teach in the theology department. Um, I have many favorite poems. This is one that I encountered about five years ago in the New Yorker magazine, and I never forgot it. Um, so it's called Hattie McDaniel Arrives at the Coconut Grove. And just a word about Hattie McDaniel. She won the Academy Award in 1940 for her role as Mammy in Gone with the Wind. And um, that caused some controversy. In northern cities, she was criticized for having accepted the role at all of portraying a black woman as a servant. And in the South, the movie was boycotted because her name appeared on the marquee along with Clark Gable and Vivian Lee. So she was found herself at the center of a controversy that uh, she did not expect. And this poem charmed me because it really shows the brilliance and grace of this wonderful woman. Hattie McDaniel arrives at the Coconut Grove late in aqua and ermine, gardenias scaling her left sleeve in a spasm of scent, her gloves white, her smile chastened, purse giddy with stars and rhinestones clipped to her brilliantined hair. On her, on her free arm, that fine Negro, Mr. Wonderful Smith. It's the day that isn't, February 29th, at the end of the shortest month of the year, and the shittiest, too, everywhere except Hollywood, California, where the maid can wear mink and still be a maid, bobbing her bandaged head and cursing the white folks under her breath as she smiles and shoes their silly daughters in from the night dew. What can she be thinking of, striding into the ballroom where no black face has ever showed itself except above a serving tray? Hi, hat Hattie, Mama Mac, her haughtiness, the little lady from Showboat whose name Bing forgot, Beulah and Bertha and Melina and Carrie and Violet and Cynthia and Fidelia, one half of the dark barramores. Dear Mammy, we can't help but hug you, crawl into your generous lap, tease you with such arch innuendo so that we can feel that much more wicked and youthful and sleek. But oh, what we forgot, the four husbands, the phantom pregnancy, your famous parties, your celebrated icebox cake your giggle above the red petticoats rustle, black girl and white girl walking hand in hand down the railroad tracks in Kansas City, six years old. The man who advised you, now that you are famous, to begin eliminating your more common acquaintances, and your reply, catching him square in the eye, that's a good idea. I'll start right now by eliminating you. Is she or isn't she? Three million dishes, a truckload of aprons, and head drags later, and here you are, poised between husbands and factions, no corset wide enough to hold you in, your huge face a dark moon split by that spontaneous smile, your trademark, your curse. No matter, Hattie. It's a long, beautiful walk into that flower-smothered standing ovation. So go on and make them wait. I have to switch from dark glasses to uh, reading glasses for this. I am Brenda Tiefenbrook, and I direct the math tutoring down south. And I do come from a little bit further south in the world. And I bring to you a book 
which has many favorite poems in it, 101 famous poems. And this book was given to my uncle on the occasion of his 12th Christmas in 1929. And he gave it to me. So it came from his uncle to me and passed down the road. Sometimes poems seem to come by seasons. And the first one is William Wordsworth's The Daffodils. I tried to find something with some daffodils on it. I'm not sure if I succeeded. So. I wandered lonely as a cloud that floats on high over vales and hills, when all at once I saw a crowd a host of golden daffodils beside the lake, beneath the trees, fluttering and dancing in the breeze, continuous as the stars that shine and twinkle on the Milky Way. They stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft when on my couch I lie in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. <laughs> I, who have so many allergies, really <laughs> do have to imagine daffodils more often than see. And I've never seen 10,000 daffodils. A second one comes, and I'm a math person, so see there was a number in there. There was 10,000. And this one also has a number. Uh, this poem came more recently to me. It was in, um, I do a lot of church work, and it was in a stewardship you know, one of those little things that gets stuck in your church bulletin, you never say, take the time to read. Well, I did, and I've put it out on my bulletin and board. That's why it has holes in it. Some people actually stop and read it. Now this is a little bit more of the political side of life. Don't Show Us by Paul Turley. Don't show us the goose that laid the golden egg, the horn of plenty, the pot of gold, and the winning ticket. Show us the horn of enough, the good fresh egg, the pot of stew, and the union ticket. Don't let us be the desperate ones who play the numbers, fly to Vegas, and cross our fingers for a horse named Lucky Jim. Let our dreams not be of People magazine, David Letterman's couch in solitaire on our own tropical island. Let us be the makers of politics for the polis, commonwealth that is commonwealth, welfare that is truly fair, and may we place solidarity in our neighborhoods and towns. May, me, may we be the ones who see the fish on every plate, the fire in every hearth, and the good roof strong above every soul. So the southern came out there. That roof is actually roof to y'all up here. The last one is from Lee Bennett Hopkins, who's an elementary teacher. And that's part of my background, too. And the course I teach here in the spring is math for elementary teachers. And I made them read this one. And uh, Lee Bennett Hopkins had, had a few words about it. And then I'll read a little bit more about it. He says, the main reason I compile theme-oriented collections of poetry such as Marvelous Math is due to my being an elementary school teacher. I compile the kinds of poetry books I wish I had had while I was teaching. And why not combine, combine poetry with mathematics? Why not combine poetry with every area of the curriculum? My philosophy is that poetry must be shared every day in every way possible. And this was printed in an article in Teaching Children Mathematics magazine where they took this poem, Fractions, and the canoe, which is a uh, round, which the, sta uh, the stood up band might play occasionally out on the veranda, the canoe, and taught children fractions by teaching them to jump and hop in patterns. So the elementary teachers, the, the students I had that are going to be elementary teachers read this and then wrote a reflection, of course, on it. And Fractions by Lee Bennett Hopkins, written in 1997. 
Broken number pieces, disconnected. A quarter, a half, an eighth. Fragmented, out of order, out of control, until I explore them, restore them, make them whole once more again. Thank you. Hello, I'm a little taller. Pardon me. My name is Ryan Carter. I am a business librarian over on the Minneapolis campus. I'm new to the St. Thomas community and very happy to be here. Um, everybody else has really good poems. I don't necessarily have a very good poem. <laughs> it <laughs> um, nor does it mean a ton to me. What I really, really wanted to do was find this one that I had found when I was an undergraduate. It was in, I, I studied a lot of German when I was an undergrad. It was fantastic. It was neat. It was about all these things. And it ended with, don't ask me how, ask the dog. And it was really, really cool. But it's very easy to find English poetry on the web. It's very, very difficult to find German poetry on the web, especially when you can't get the declensions right. <coughs> Those are, um, so I found one by Ogden Nash. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was an Italian, and some people thought he was a rapscallion, but he wasn't offended because other people thought he was splendid. And he said the world was round and everybody made an uncomplimentary sound. But he went and tried to borrow some money from Ferdinand. Ferdinand said America was a bird in the bush, and he'd rather have a bird in hand. But Columbus's brain was fertile. It wasn't arid, and he remembered that Ferdinand was married. And he thought, there is no wife like a misunderstood one, because if her husband thinks something is a terrible idea, she is bound to think it is a good one. So he performed, he perfumed his handkerchief with rum and citronella, and he went to see Isabella. And she looked wonderful, but he had never felt sillier. And she said, I can't place the face, but the aroma is familiar. And Columbus didn't say a word. All he said was, I'm Columbus, the 15th century Admiral Byrd. And just as he thought, her disposition was very malleable. So Columbus said, somebody show me the sunset. And somebody did, and he set sail for it. And he discovered America, and they put him in jail for it. And the fetters gave him welts, and they named America after somebody else. So the sad fate of Columbus ought to be pointed out to every child and every voter because it has a very important moral, which is, don't be a discoverer, be a promoter. Hello, uh, I'm Julianne Larkin from the Office of Academic Affairs, and I have a very short poem, and I found it in the Spirituality and Health magazine, and it's been with me through many changes in my life, and uh, the reason I like it is because it talks about the simple things in life and the things that we all want and need and unify us as human beings on this earth, the things that we hold in common like the need for bread, for food, a place to belong, love and beauty, and the joys and sorrows that we all share. And it was also originally written in another language, which to me makes it span time and culture. So the author is Roque Dalton, and it's translated by Jack Hirschman. And the title is Like You. Like you, I love love, life, the sweet smell of things, the sky blue landscape of January days. And my blood boils up and I laugh through eyes that have known the buds of tears. I believe the world is beautiful and that poetry like bread is for everyone. And that my veins don't end in me but in those but in the unanimous blood of those who struggle for life, love, little things, landscape and bread, the poetry of everyone. Uh, my name is Dave Nimmer. And Julie Kimlinger asked me to read a poem. I turned her down at first, but she said, I have a particular role for you to fill. She said, I'm looking for somebody old 
and somebody who used to be somebody, <laughs> and somebody who, who thought perhaps he could still come up one more time and say something fairly accurate. And I said, well, I suppose I might fill that role for you. So here I am, retired, a former professor of journalism. And I chose a poem by Mary Rose O'Reilly called Speaking in Tongues. And I first heard about Mary Rose O'Reilly when I was an advisor to the Aquin because the kids who were on the staff would talk about this woman. They said that she made, him, made them think and they said that they thought she respected what they had to say and that she wasn't afraid of tackling big questions like how do we come to know God? And she had a reputation for making her class safe to explore matters of faith and doubt in both prose and poetry. You gotta love a woman like that. And I chose speaking in tongues because I think it eloquently examines the spiritual journey. And I think that's what this part of life is about, to seek connections, to find some meaning, to look for not answers but better questions. And Mary Rose O'Reilly chooses words that are precise and powerful, and she finds ways to capture the feeling that I think I share with her. And I suspect deep down this woman's got a sense of humor. Speaking in tongues, I go to church every Sunday, though I don't believe a word of it, because the longing for God is a prayer said in the bones. When people call on Jesus, I move to a place in the body where such words rise. One of the valleys where hope pins itself to desire. We have so much landscape like that, you'd think we were made to sustain a cry. When the old men around me lift their hands as though someone had cornered them, giving it all away. I remember a dock on the estuary, watching a heron get airborne against the odds. It's the transitional moment that baffles me, how she composes her rickety grocery cart of a body to make that flight. The pine siskin stalled on a windy coast remembers the woods she will long for when needs arise. So the boreal forest composes itself in my mind, first as a rift, absence, then in a tumble of words undone from sense, like the stutter you hear when somebody falls over the cliff of language. Call it a gift. Oh, yeah. Thanks. Julie, you have to put us in order of height from now on. Uh, I'm Bill Kirchkessner. I work in the University Relations Department. A, um, a poem grabbed me several years ago when I was uh, rafting on the Colorado River at the base of the Grand Canyon. And I'm not going to read that poem today. Um, but it, it got me going with poetry once again, which I hadn't touched for quite a long time. But today I'm going to read a, a poem titled Directions by Billy Collins. Um, it seems that most of the poetry that I'm drawn to is poetry that has to do with the outside. So, directions. You know that brick path in the back of the house, the one you see from the kitchen window? the one that bends around the far end of the garden where all the yellow primroses are. And you know how if you leave that path and you walk up into the woods and come to that heap of rocks, probably pushed down during the horrors of the Ice Age, and a grove of tall hemlocks, dark green now against the light brown fallen leaves. And further on, you know, there's that small footbridge with the broken railing, and if you go beyond and, and you arrive at the bottom of that sheep's head hill, well, if you start climbing, and you might have to grab hold of a sapling, go and get steep there, you'll eventually come to a long stone ridge with a border of pine trees, which is as high as you can go, and it's a good enough place to stop. The best time is in the late afternoon. The sun stroves through the columns of trees as you are hiking up. And when you find an agreeable rock to sit on, you'll be able to see the light pouring down into the woods and breaking into the shapes and tones of things. And you'll hear nothing but a sprig of birdsong or a leaf falling, uh, the falling of a cone 
or a nut through the trees. And if this is your day, you might even spot a hare or feel the wing beats of geese driving overhead towards some destination. But it's hard to speak of these things, how the voices of light enter the body and begin to recite their stories, how the earth holds us painfully against its breast made of humus and brambles, how we who will soon be gone regard the entities that continue to return, greener than ever, spring water flowing through the meadow and through the shadows of clouds passing over the hills, and the ground where we stand in the tremble of thought taking the vast outside into ourselves. Still, let me know when you set out. Come knock on my door. I'll walk with you as far as the garden with one hand on your shoulder. I'll even watch after you and not turn back to the house until you disappear into the crowd of maple and ash. You'll be heading up the, toward the hill, piercing the ground with your stick. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kirsten Deerking. Oh, it's so nice to hear poetry out in the sunshine in the springtime. I'm so glad this event is still going, and thanks, Julie, for inviting me back. Um, I used to work at the St. Thomas Library here for seven years, so it's just it's so nice to be able to come back. And the poem I'm going to read today is called Duck Love by Jim Crusoe. It's one of my favorite poems, partly because it has ducks in it, and I always like animal and bird kind of poems and that kind of thing. The other thing is that it's simply my favorite love poem, and I think it inspires, it inspires us to be better. Um, okay, duck love. They see each other every minute of the day, and still they can't get enough. In the water and on land, they make love constantly. When one of them is hungry, the other's, the other's there with a piece of duckweed or a fish. You look great, one's always shouting to the other. No, you look great, the other one says back. They can't imagine a world where they're not together. And we're just ducks, they say. Think of what it must be like for humans. Thank you. Thank you, Kirsten, um, and everybody. I, I, I've said before that poetry on the patio is kind of like a potluck, and um, you know we don't tell people what to read. We uh, uh, allow people to bring whatever they want to, uh, as you do at any potluck. Um, and so sometimes you get all salad and sometimes you get all dessert, but you know, we've been really lucky that we get some hot dishes and main courses and things. Um, and it seems like every year I'm always amazed and uh, delighted with the choices that people make. So thank you all uh, very much. I wanted to mention uh, a couple of things that we are working on. Uh, after 11 years, we have a long list of poems that people have read uh, at this event, and we are actually creating a bibliography of everything that has been read at Poetry on the Patio. When I say we, I mean Julie. Um, uh, and that's going to be, we'll be linking to that from our, our, our website. Remember that it is the 50th anniversary of uh, O'Shaughnessy Library um, uh, this year, and so it'll be part of that. Uh, that. We've also videotaped, thanks to our friends at um, uh, uh, Media Services, every single one of these, and we'll be creating a, um, uh, like a video. Is it outtakes and bloopers? No, it's not. It's the highlights of uh, the highlights of Poetry on the Patio on video, and we'll be having uh, that will be linked to from the site as well. So, if you have read here in the past, I hope that you've signed the little waiver saying that uh, that you don't mind having your image, um, r you know, released to the whole world via the internet. Um, I'm I'm just kidding. I don't think we have such a waiver, do we, Julie? Uh, maybe we should. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, it was wonderful. Help yourself to treats and coffee over there.